Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode 55. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Cazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here for this Friday show. Hopefully you guys all had a happy and safe and full Thanksgiving, enjoying the games that happened last night. Dave, hopefully you did as well. How you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, you're not you're not uh, out there uh, running around on Black Friday, are you? Uh. Uh. Not pay me enough to be one of those people. I think it's not as bad as it used to be. I think most places close and don't open at 5 a.m., but I don't know who would want to go to, to Lowe's at 5 a.m. to get the racket set, you know, $8 off. I just don't know who that person is, but yeah, they're out there. Me either, and my wife uh, made sure to show me some of the holiday traffic uh, footage on the uh, on the news last night, and some of it coming out of – most of it coming out of uh, L.A., and holy moly, there's no way in the world you could get me. I mean, uh, I understand people have to like to travel, and, and obviously with COVID, you know, uh, probably didn't get to travel last, I don't know, year or whatever, you know, but uh, whew, uh, no way I want to be out there on that bumper-to-bumper freeway like that. But I hope, mm. hopefully people that do have to get out and or did get out uh, are you know, safe coming and going and all like that, but I'm, I'm glad it's not me. Me too. All right, Dave, let's talk about the Steelers here as they get ready for Sunday's very pivotal game against the Cincinnati Bengals. Let's begin with the Thursday injury report. A little bit later today, we'll have the final Friday injury report with game designations and things like that. Yesterday, though, no major surprises and overall some good news during the week um, thus far. Uh, not practicing, no surprises here. J.C. Haas and I with that pectoral injury and Eric Ebron with that knee. Both kind of believe that Ebron will go to IR uh, sometime on Saturday, Haas and I will see if he joins him or not. Some guys moving in the right direction. Those include Isaiah Laudamilk, who practiced in full on Thursday, missed last week with a groin injury. TJ Watt's been limited both of the uh, last two days, so those are positive signs overall for Watt. And Joe Hayden got in a limited day of practice on Thanksgiving after not practicing on Wednesday. And Trey Turner, by the way, practiced in full on Thursday after not practicing on Wednesday due, due to what they're calling a knee injury. So looking good for Watt, Laudamook, and I think Hayden's got a decent chance to play as well. Yeah, and boy, they uh, they need a couple of those dogs back, don't they? <clears throat> Definitely mm-hmm. need uh, Watt back. It'd be nice, to, obviously, to get Hayden back out there. He's moving in the right direction, as you uh, said. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens with Arthur Millett uh, added with an illness on Thursday as did not practice. I'd imagine this is about the time of, time of year, too, where the, where the flu starts uh, circling around uh, for uh, in a few of these locker rooms. But I think as we sit here right now, my best guess would be Hassenhauer and Ebron don't play. Uh, one of those, if not both of those guys, are probably going to move to IR uh, mm-hmm. on, on, on Saturday. Ebron probably for sure. Uh, and then we'll just, you know, I, I think the Friday injury report will tell us more about what we want to know about guys like Hayden and 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 Arthur Millette specifically because it sounds like Trey Turner is going to be fine. It sounds like Louder Milk's going to be fine there. So uh, and once again, uh, big big boom if they can get Watt and uh, Watt and Hayden back this week. Yeah, it would be, and especially on a week where the Bengals seem to be incredibly healthy, as Paul Daner mentioned on Wednesday's show. I believe Auden Tate received Auden Tate, the only player not to practice at all yesterday for them. So the Bengals are a healthy team, and Pittsburgh needs to kind of match them. Yeah, and Tate's uh, probably going to miss the game. He's missed uh, the last on what three or four games, I think, with uh, with that whatever uh, that that uh, thigh or whatever he's dealing with there. But he's the only one uh, that did not practice. I think the rest of the uh, eight or nine players on their injury report, the Bengals, uh, practiced fully on Thursday. So barring any any of them having any kind of setbacks, they will be uh, an extremely healthy team on Sunday at home against the Steelers. Yeah, for sure, and it'll be a competitive game. We'll talk about that game in a little bit. Dave, let's move on now to the coordinator's corner, as we always do for a Friday show, even on Thanksgiving. The team practiced and had Keith Butler, Matt Canada, speaking with the media yesterday. Let's begin with Keith Butler, because it was a lot more, as typically is is the case, a lot more there with Keith Butler than there was with Matt Canada. And obviously, I think that the biggest thing from what Butler said were some very you know, blunt and honest 
the comments and assessment of, of one Devin Bush and Butler's thoughts on Devin Bush's play, Dave, and I thought just what Butler had to say was, was pretty inter- interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Did you get uh, Minka coming off of the COVID list yesterday? Oh, no, I did not. I apologize. Yeah, Minka Fitzpatrick officially activated off of COVID uh, yesterday, so he spent 10 days on the reserve reserve COVID list. Obviously, he missed Week 11's game against the Chargers, so he'll be back and, and good to go for Sunday's game against the Bengals. And Ray Ray McLeod still on the COVID mm-hmm. list, and I mean, straight. You know, we don't know what what you know stage he's in, but I think it's a pretty good pretty good bet that uh, Ray Ray McLeod's probably going to miss this game uh, on, on the COVID list. So we'll know for sure, I think, by Saturday there. But probably a good bet bet about that but uh it is good news that they got minka back and uh keith butler was asked is, is minka at 100 percent?" he says as far as i know he looks like he's 100 percent out there to me uh we'll see he'll practice today and see how he feels and stuff like that you you never can tell he knows our smartest uh, you know goes on from there so uh seems like uh minka's good to go and but they need they need a big game out of him too because they're you know mm-hmm. once again they're, they're gonna probably need a few turnovers uh uh, in this game, and I think a lot of people forget too. You go back to that Week Three game, uh, <clears throat> and you know the, the, uh, the Steelers obviously lost that one at home to the Bengals there, but but they were without Deontay Johnson, uh, T.J. Watt, and Alex Highsmith for that right. game. So both of your pass rushers you didn't have uh, starting pass rushers, and your you know uh, <clears throat> probably less than arguably. Uh, uh, best wide receiver as well in, in, in Deontay Johnson. So that's a huge, huge difference between this game and last game. Now, obviously, uh, Watt's coming off of coming off of that injury there, but uh, they're, they're not going to put him out there if they don't think that uh, he can get the job done. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, as we mentioned, good good that they have uh, Minka Fitzpatrick back this week as well, too. Uh, you talk about uh, Devin Bush, and, yeah, that was kind of the, 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 the key takeaway there. Uh, you know, the media kept trying to, I think, give, give Keith Butler a chance to make some excuses, you know, for, uh, for, for Devin Bush and, uh, long story short, you know, Keith, Keith Butler's not into that. I don't think. And, you know, he said, look, you know, what, how is the ACL and all like that? You know, people at, they asked him if his ACL might be slowing him down. Uh, and in so many words, I, you know, I, I, I think Keith, doesn't believe that to be the case. Uh, he did say, "Look, you you got to be able to run after the football and and run down. You know, in so many words, run downhill at the football." And that's one mm-hmm. of the things that we've talked about, uh, at least showing up on tape that you know Devin Bush is not attacking the line of scrimmage on on a lot of these plays, not doing a good job of getting off uh, off of these blocks. And really, in so many words, uh, that 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 was the takeaway from from Keith Butler and his comments on uh, on Devin Bush on Thursday. Yeah, I thought there were two portions of his commentary on Bush that were super interesting, and I'll just kind of read some of the quotes here, and and, and I'll I'll kind of uh, summarize them, then read the whole thing. But he says, um, quote, playing linebacker is knowing the front and knowing the coverage. He's got to know both for him to play as much as he has. He's got to learn more and more as time goes on for him. The more he knows, the quicker he's going to react, the more confident he is. So that was the first part that kind of caught my eye. And so I know Obviously, Dave, the, the Bush missed, you know, three quarters of last season. But for a third year linebacker and a guy that's played a lot of football overall, including his rookie season, including uh, before he got hurt last year and including this year, of course, for a coach to sit, sit there and say he's got to learn more. It, it's a it's an uneasy comment to, to, to read. It certainly is, and I think you, uh, you and I in the last couple of podcasts, too, have talked about well, wonder what's up with his kind of his mental processing of it, you know, mm, right. uh, it that's not the thing that you want to hear on a third year linebacker of uh, a first round guy that you traded up for a guy yeah. that uh, played uh, obviously uh, 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 a lot was, was the key part of that defense at Michigan when he was there as well too. Uh, the fact that you have to have a defensive coordinator come out and, and, and talk about that kind of stuff is, is concerning. Now, is he just not, is he, is he studying it and just not getting it, not processing it? That could very well well be the case as well too. You know, maybe he's uh, may, maybe at Michigan it was more instincts than than than, mm-hmm. than actually knowing 
knowing a role. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, or just being a 4-4 guy in college football that like, sometimes is enough to get you by. Sure, sure. Maybe the athleticism did yeah. did just get him by. Now, here, here, once again, I hate to keep going back to this. You get you 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 go back and you look at uh, the production or lack thereof that 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 Bush had against uh, ra- you know, uh, ranked teams throughout his career. It wasn't great at all. All right, so. You know, maybe, maybe there were signs there, but I it it is very concerning that, and I I think so many words too. Uh, 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 Keith Butler said, "Look, it could be a C to do type thing," you know, mm-hmm. on top of it there. So I'm not con- I'm not totally convinced that that Bush is grasping just the playbook element of it first to start with, and then on top of it, there are signs of him. Uh, there are signs of him that ACL being fine, I think, because, and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, you look at the sideline, the sideline stuff. In fact, you know, our, our own Jonathan Hytrader, I think we pointed, pointed this out the other day, you know, posted a clip there, uh, uh, dump off over there to the side where uh, Bush, you, you see the athleticism there. So I, I don't, I don't think it's a knee issue with the burst and the start stop and all like that. I just think the rest of it, He's fine play, r- running out in space and sideline to sideline. Mm-hmm. I just think everything else with him, uh, and and specifically his 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 want to 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 play downhill is certainly not there. And there are times where it just looks like he's not does not know what to do in that defense. And that's that's pro- that might be the most concerning yeah. thing uh, 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 of it all. It really is. And that downhill issue or lack thereof is not new to this year. It's been an issue, I think, even his first two years in the league and taking on blocks and learning how to, you know, take on these 300 pound linemen when you're a 230 pound linebacker. And, and that's always been the big issue, issue for those undersized linebackers that could run and hit, but, but can they take on blocks and meet someone in the hole? And so that's not something that's brand new to him this year. I think it's maybe more of an issue this season, more pronounced, but um, I don't think it's brand new for him. And so, yeah, I mean, there are moments where you see him run and just open up and, and play with speed. You think about the play that you mentioned that Jonathan talked about, I think about a play in week one against Buffalo, running sideline to sideline, making a tackle out of bounds. Um, I think about running with Tyler Boyd in uh, the first matchup against the Bengals that led to that uh, Minka Fitzpatrick tip that led to the Terrell Edmonds interception. I mean, when this guy opens it up, he can still run. So I don't think think that's a that's a major issue for him. Again, I don't know what's going on in his head and in his heart, but um, I don't see the the ACL being something that's, that's dramatically, significantly holding him back. No, I think his own mental processing uh, uh, does not allow him to play as fast right. as, 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 and, and show some of that athleticism as well, you know? So mm-hmm. uh, it this is a huge concern at this point now. Yeah, uh, and, uh, you know, I understand the way Mike Tomlin kind of, you know, wanted to, to, to uh, you know, at least keep, keep confidence, showing confidence in the player and mm-hmm. kind of brush some of this stuff under, under the table, if you will. But uh, it, 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 it is very concerning. I think at this point to hear Keith Butler say the things that he said, and, and nobody is as blunt sometimes as, <laughs> uh, and, and, and honest when it, you know, comes to things as Keith Butler. So I, I think you got a huge red flag here to be honest with right. you, Alex. And I think Butler's perspectives, obviously, as the D.C. as the coach is always important, but he was a former linebacker and a good one for 10 years. So, like, he knows what it takes to play the position and play, well, a different era playing in the 80s, of course. He was not a guy that, like, Devin Bush wasn't built the same, but but knows what it takes. And listen, I think Devin Bush, you know, I, I don't want to say he's lazy because I think he put in a ton of work this offseason to get his body ready for week one. I know I harp on this every single time, but I feel like no one else talks about it. So I just want to commend him for being available and being ready for the season and playing the snaps he's playing right now. I mean, he could easily miss half the season, you know, still rehabbing that, that knee. So I don't want to say he's not, he hasn't worked hard, but it does feel like he's not, as you said, processing the lack of C to do is what's slowing him down more than, than the knee injury itself. I, I, I absolutely. Look, I, I, you know, I don't hate, I hate the kid at all. I mean, it's just some, sometimes you either have it or you don't, uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff here. And it is concerning at this point. And I, I think it's a shame that he had to go through what he had to go through with his with his knee injury. I think he, he worked you know, as hard as you see any player work, uh, when it comes mm-hmm. to that stuff there. But, uh, you have to judge these players the way they, you know, the way they play on Sundays right now. Right. And, uh, and, and once again, we try to give him the benefit of the, uh, of the doubt as far as, okay, trust it. Everybody says you want to try, you know, he, he, maybe he don't, doesn't trust the knee. Look, there are, once again, there is 
But as Alex even said, even going back to week one, there is enough evidence, I think, on tape that, that shows that that knee, uh, that his athleticism isn't the issue. It's the, it's the want to and the see to do, uh, I think, that are both lacking with him. And at this point in his career, and once again, there, there, there's, there's what, six games left in the season now? Uh, <laughs> you, you, better, you better turn it on in a hurry here. I mean, yeah. you really, you really got to start seeing this uh, in these next few games, and and these next few games specifically, uh, because if they don't, if they don't get at least one win in these next two games, it, it it's it's going to be hard not to start talking about what's going to happen in a draft and, and right. those kind of things there. And I think at this point, it, it, you know, it's not unthinkable that the Steelers pick up his his fifth year option, I guess. But I would be surprised with what we've seen so far if mm-hmm. that happens. But a lot can change, I think, in the last uh, you know however many games here. All right, seven games to seven go, games. and next two against the AFC North opponents that run the ball and run the ball pretty well. So um, certainly something to watch there. The other comment that Butler made that that certainly caught my attention, and again, just kind of reading the back end of the quote here, he says, uh, "quote." He's got to run to the ball and get both hands on the ball carrier in practice all the time. He's got to dadgum run to the ball. We demand that from the rest of them. He's got to do the same thing, and he does, and hopefully he'll get better. So he kind of tries to couch that at the, it at the, at the end, end there. He says yeah. that he does, but he's kind of implying that he doesn't. And listen, I'm not one to comment on players' effort. I very rarely do that because I think it's a very damning thing to say. And again, I don't know what's going on going on in guys' heads and hearts. And to call it effort to me, I think is a really serious accusation. And so, I mean, you can interpret that Butler comment however you want, but that is not a positive comment overall, clearly. No, there, there. I mean, it shows up on tape too. So I mean, it's not like you know, there, there are some effort issues at times on certain plays with him. And what, what have you seen? Because I, I've struggled to identify that. But again, maybe that's my perspective. I really try not to think about it in those terms. I just, so, I think some of those tackle attempts are, are half, yeah. half. You know what? Uh, I think sometimes his. his uh, his his what to when when take on some of those guards coming after him uh, is it great and I don't think he I don't think he gives it his all to uh, uh, look I I will say this about Kendrick Green he he obviously has his warts and all uh, this season as a rookie but nobody's gonna question his effort or his fight right. or, or or the dog in him that guy's a nasty you know what you know what <laughs> you know you know what. Uh, Keep on censoring yourself today, Dave. Right. Uh, it is the holidays after all. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you look at that film, you think, oh, man, I'd hate to – I would hate to have, have, have uh, bumped into that guy from behind at a party or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't get that feel with Devin Bush, all right? Uh, uh, there, you once again, you can see, you know, you go back to that high school kid. He's a dog. He's a dog. You know, uh, talking about all of his teammates and, and mm-hmm. all calling them all dogs. I don't view Devin Bush as a dog right now. You know, and yeah. uh, 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 and I think some of that, some of that not wanting to shows up on tape at times. Yeah, no, I think uh, Th- this I, year I, I specifically, I, I I haven't really thought that up until this year. And look, I got I got the heck I got a lot of nasty comments on Twitter too for calling out some of these things earlier in the season. Now I think people are starting to realize that that I just don't have it in for the player that I mm-hmm. I, I try to let people know what's on tape, you know. Yeah, and Bush's off season did not start well with the tweets and the things that he said, and you know, there's certainly I think some level of growing up that he has to do. And the guy's young; he's what 23, 24. So I mean, he's not a 34 year old guy, but you know that. It just wasn't a good start to the year, and it certainly has not been a good so far end to the year. I, I, I want to throw this out here, and this is just a, a rough, uh, and, and I have nothing to go by here, but, I mean, this is a son of a former NFL player, uh, all mm-hmm. like that. Do you think there's an aspect of, you know what, uh, I, I've, I've played football to this point because maybe, you know, trying to live up to what my dad wanted me to do and – you know, now now that I'm at the, at at the big show, my athleticism obviously got me by. My dad was at a big program uh, with me there at Michigan, and 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 do you think he's may, you know is there a possibility that maybe football just isn't his passion? 
It's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it in that way. I mean, I have no idea is my short answer. I mean, because I don't know what's in his head and in, 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 in I, and his I'm, heart. I'm not saying it definitely is, but I mean, you hear all these all the time about these kids that, you know, trying to live all up right. to what their father wants them to live up to. And, and I'm, I imagine that, you know, a lot of them obviously don't make it to, to the pros and all like that. But, uh, you know, there, there's something to be said about, 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 about kids that, you know, mm. the pressure of maybe live up to, uh, to, to, to what their, their, their family wants and expects of them. But when they get to a certain level, they're not happy at all. And, you know, they're, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And, you know, I have thought that about Devin Bush, especially with we, the lineage that he comes from. And his dad's a pretty, uh, you know, pretty strong alpha male yeah. type. Who coached him really hard. I remember right. the stories when he got drafted. His dad coached him really hard as a kid growing up. I mean, I, I have no idea. I'm not a psychologist. I couldn't answer that, but I, I, I get what you're saying. Okay. I mean, I, I just that 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 has crossed my mind as well too throughout this season. But again, I will say with how hard he worked this off season to get to get ready for the start of the season does tell me something in a positive way that about commitment and work ethic and doing those things when no one's watching in a pandemic, no less. I think we have to appreciate how tough that journey was for him and how much work he had to have put in to get ready. Cause he was ready day one at training camp. And that's, that's really remarkable when you tear your ACL in October. And you don't know how much joking he was doing on, on social media and all, but it, it did certainly seem out of character, you know, almost like an attempt to sabotage himself, you know, uh, I, once again, I, you know, I don't want to get into the sports psychology end of it there, but, uh, uh, you know, Starting early on in this offseason or middle way through this offseason and on, there's been rough patches for, for, for Devin Bush. And, and once again, you hate to see any first round draft pick, especially for the Steelers fall, because they have so much invested uh, in, in these, you know, the way they build their organization through the draft and how important it is to, to have these first rounders hit and get to their second contracts and all mm-hmm. like that. But uh, uh, right now, I, I, I think you really, really have to question and, you know, uh, uh, the future of Devin Bush and people, someone said, well, do you cut him now? No, you don't cut him now. But uh, uh, I think in these next couple of games, <laughs> you really have to consider if, if you're not seeing what you're, what you're expecting to see out of him uh, of, of potentially as, as you talked, I think on that last show, maybe playing him in less, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, less situations there, getting a guy like Robert Splane, you know, all, all on the field and those kind of things there. And then maybe just kind of hope that, 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 that Devin kind of works to it and all, but, uh, uh, it, it is a, an extremely concerning situation with him right now. And hopefully he can turn this around in the final seven games. There is time for him mm-hmm. to turn this thing around, uh, and, and get himself in a position where he, very deserving of that fifth year option, but man, it's got to happen and it's got to start happening like on Sunday against Cincinnati. Yeah, it does. Uh, you know, my thoughts, I place Blaine and base. Maybe the team's hesitancy to not make a move is because if they make a change, it's going to hurt his confidence even more and maybe spiral him all the more. And maybe that's not a good reason to do it or not, but I wonder if that's part of the team's calculation because Tomlin has seemed to take more of the, I don't want to say coddled, but more, you know, good cop approach to, to, to Devin Bush and trying to, to, get him through this with a, you know, an arm around him instead of a kick in the butt. It seems to be Tomlin's approach. I mean, look, this is a, when you draft, when you go up and you get a guy like this and all, and especially an inside, inside linebacker in the Steelers defense and all, uh, this is a guy that you expect to be the quarterback on your, of your defense. This is a guy that you expect to be out there in 98% of the plays, uh, throughout, throughout the season there. Uh, you know, there, he, he's, you know, you kind of wonder, is he even green dot worthy at certain points now? Because does he even, does he know even, you know, how to properly relay some of these things? And especially pre-snap too. Is is he making the right checks? You know, uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 might he be responsible for some of this miscommunication that's going on uh, in, in the defense? Because he, after all, he is supposed to, when he's out there, he's got the green dot on. He's supposed to be the hub of this thing. Uh, you know, when you think of past quarterbacks uh, 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 of of this defense, the the uh, the Farriers, right? The uh, I mean, even mm-hmm. Ryan Shazier. Uh, do you do you have confidence that right now that Devin Bush is going to be that quarterback of the defense? Not right now. And again, that's a more intangible thing that's harder for us to judge and evaluate. But he certainly, you know, 
isn't on that level of a Farrier or Shazier or even a Vince Williams who, you know, for the lack of physical tools that he had in terms of athletic ability, he was the great communicator and physical guy and, and just that dog that you talked about. Imagine if Vince Williams had the athleticism of Devin Bush. Oh, man, you'd be literally an all pro kind of player. I mean, that that's I mean, we're talking. Yeah, we're talking. We're talking a guy that that, you know, run and hit, run and hit. I mean, just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, he'd be a, be a Kirkland kind of guy. There Kirkland was that impossibly huge guy with the broadest shoulders ever you could land a plane on, but he could run like maybe not maybe not like Devin Bush, but pretty close. And so you'd get a player like a, a Kirkland or a Kendrell, uh, Kendrell Bell before his injury. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. And again, I want to be careful of not piling on to Devin Bush, but certainly his play's not been good, and we have to talk about that. Right, and, and, and people are going to say, well, you just spent 15 minutes piling on Devin Bush. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we – Based on what the way uh, Keith Butler answered some of those questions on Thursday, it, it needed a deeper conversation yeah. about it. I I, I got to be honest with you. I'll, I'll be surprised if he turns this thing around. Plain, plain and simple. And I, hopefully he can prove me wrong and all like that. But, uh, I mean, here we are in his third season now. If you're talking about this guy wondering from a see-to-do process and, 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 and not running to the football all the right. time, uh, that's those I can I, I, right I can work around well he's not trusting that knee yet you know ki- kind of aspect there but uh the rest of this stuff man it it's damning it's damning it is let's talk about the rest of what Keith Butler had to say kind of one other part that was pretty notable to me asking about the reporter did about Isaiah Laudamook and what they liked about him um Butler said quote I asked uh, defense line coach Carl Dunbar about him we talked about him in the draft room and liked him liked his size he looked a little bit like Cam when he came up so he always always compares Laudamook to, to Cam Hayward but uh says uh, he's smart he's a smart guy he's going to help us eventually down the line he's helping his team now and he's playing some some better football and uh, assuming he can get back this week after missing the Chargers game with that groin injury uh they need him they need some defensive line depths and i think he can provide some of that and i think didn't we just say on a past show as well too look uh, i'm surprised at what this kid's doing right now a i didn't think he'd even hardly be playing but injuries uh have necessitated that so you're throwing already a guy that's behind the eight ball guy that you're thinking gonna take a little bit of time to develop it develop even in a perfect uh, uh, scenario out there having to play, and he's he's representing himself well. So I mean, I think that's all that you can ask for at, 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 at this point. And we don't know when Stefan Tuitt's going to come back, if he's going to come back here. Uh, and you know, they they definitely, as we talk, you know, need to get Henry Mondo out of there. Uh, yeah. uh, some probably use Bugs and Carlos Davis situationally. Uh, if, 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 if at all possible there, and maybe that'll shore things up a little bit, but, uh, uh you are going to still have to rely on, on, on a guy in, uh, Isaiah Loudermilk to play a fairly con- you know, considerable amount of snaps here. So, so far so good with him. And I think the most interesting aspect and really with the, with all the rookie class in general is you get into like week six or week seven of next year, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that that's really where you start to see, uh, 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 you know, sink or swim when it comes to the, these young kids and he'll obviously get, uh, get, uh, stronger during the off season. And these snaps that he's getting now are really invaluable for him, you know, because sure. he's probably going to end up playing more his rookie season by double what Cam Hayward played during his rookie season. Right. <laughs> that, oh, that's a good point. How many snaps did Cam Hayward play? <laughs> Wasn't it like 200? I, I don't know for sure, but I want to say it's like 200 and something. Anytime you say you don't know for sure, usually nail it on the mark. So I let me see if the stats go back that far, at least on Pro Football Reference. It was 262. So, yeah, they, I don't know for sure. It might have been around 261, 262. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. So that's, that's where it came from. Look, I, I, can't, I can't tell you what. I mean, I can't. I, I joke that I can't tell you what socks that I wore yesterday, but I have this thing. Believe it or not, I have this thing about socks that I can't stand to not have matching socks and no, even really. if they're from this you know the same group of six uh the the socks were made in pairs and those pairs should always stay together i don't care if they come like i said they could be the same uh cut style and all they come up from that group of six or whatnot uh they must stay together so i have found um uh, 
pr uh, uh, the company uh, Prince that makes like tennis, you know, rackets and all like that. They okay. have a pack. They have a pack of colored ones where they uh, it's a pack of six different color ones. So there's absolutely no way my wife can mess this up and not put the proper pairs together. And I bought this pair of six uh, or eight uh, colored matching uh, socks about, I don't know, eight weeks ago, I think, uh, and all. I have been the happiest person ever, <laughs> ever, ever oh, since, good. <laughs> since, since then. It's the little things, Alex. Yeah, but, it doesn't uh, take much. No, it don't. It doesn't take much, but... Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm an obsessive compulsive a, a, as it is and all, but little things mm -hmm. like that. Well, it's little things like that snap counts with, 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 with Cam Hayward, his rookie season that just get etched in my brain that I just can't let loose of. Yeah. It's uh it's wheel routes and, and match socks. It's all Ooh. it takes to, to make Dave mm -hmm. Bryan a happy man. Yep. All right. Where were we? Sorry about that. I didn't, I, I just thought I'd take you down a, a peek into my world there. My, my wife, I drives, drives her crazy as you can imagine, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, with a lot of smoke, yeah, uh, valuable snaps. And listen, I mean, could Carlos Davis get activated Saturday? And, and with some of the IR guys that might be going IR, like an Eric Ebron, like a JC Hosnauer, with Lattimo coming back, maybe you do something with Mondo. So maybe reinforcements are coming with Carlos Davis, hopefully getting a you know, full week of practice in and, and getting ready to get back in action. Boy, get your best five out there that you can this week for sure. Uh, and if that's uh, Davis and, and Bugs and Loudermilk and obviously Cam and, and Wormley, you know, Wormley's kind of an, uh, uh, probably doesn't get enough credit for the way he's played, mm -hmm. I, I think, this year. And we, we joked during the offseason, right? Man, that guy owes the Steelers some snaps because, uh, you know, that, that the injury that he had kind of early on, I think, in camp. And then obviously the, 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 the knee injury early or later in the season that cost him, cost him some snaps there. He really is, uh, 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 a guy that probably doesn't get enough praise for the way he's filled in and played a lot of these snaps as well too here. But uh, moving forward in these next few games, and, and obviously Stefan Tuitt's not going to be part of this thing, at least for the next two or three weeks uh, as it stands right now, and who knows, maybe longer. Uh, that defensive line, they got to get Cam, Cam Hayward some help out there. Yeah, it really has felt like the Cam Hayward show – in the Cam Haywood show only on that D-line this year. And that, that is one reason why this run defense has really struggled uh, so much this season. Right. All right, what else did Keith say? Or are you ready to move on to Matt Canada? Yeah, let's move on to our friend Matt Canada, who, again, continues to say not much of anything. He did, um, and I <laughs> wish I had the audio for this because I want to know if he was joking or people snickered because of it. But he was asked about um, – Actually, was more – not even asked, but told the question was, your style of offense requires a mobile quarterback, doesn't it? And Canada's response was, quote, I think we can function with whatever we've got. Ben rolled out twice. We hit one in the flat and almost hit the other one. So I think we can do whatever with whoever we've got. Ben's mobile, end quote. Mm. Um, that's an interesting definition of the word mobile. I would disagree, but uh, that was the thing that stuck out to me the most in that Canada. You wrote a whole post about that. Uh, uh, does uh... – does Canada's offense require a mobile quarterback? Right, and, and I think Canada's right in that part of it. Um, my conclusion was that it does not require a mobile quarterback. He's worked with Chandler Harnish. He's worked with Nathan Peterman and Joel Stave. I mean, he's worked with guys who can move and guys who can't move. And so I think, obviously, his offense opens up a bit more with a mobile quarterback, as it would probably any offense, uh, regardless of who the OC is. But um, I don't think that it's fair to say that Canada's offense requires mobile quarterback. But is Ben mobile? No, he is the least mobile quarterback in, in football. If Ben is mobile, then I don't know who Canada considers immobile because uh, I don't know who's, who's who can run less than, than number seven. Right, right. What else did uh, Canada have to say? Uh, you're pulling teeth at this point. Uh, talked about maybe more no huddle going forward. At least they talked about go using no huddle in that Chargers game. He said, uh, quote, yeah, we had talked about that going into that game as a possibility and then said uh, Ben's done that for a long time, but a younger, younger guy stepped up and understood. I thought we executed it well and so maybe there'll be some growing no huddle package going forward yeah and you know the way dan moore talked a couple of days ago uh seemed to let uh let a little bit out of the bag hinting that that's something they're working more towards and all like that even so we're not going to see uh five series a game uh of, of of no huddle unless the Steelers are down 28 to right. uh three or something like that uh and you get into maybe a second half situation like you got in what a couple of years ago against uh the the Bengal or uh, the, uh, the Ravens and all like that uh but 
there are there are obviously times where you I think an offense needs to be able to flip the switch and and especially if, if they can catch uh, a defensive package out there. You know, one of the things that made Brady so dangerous for and really just still is to this point is his ability to flip that switch whenever they get whenever he sees a defensive package out there that they think they can really railroad pretty good. You know, and mm-hmm. I think you have to have the ability to do that on offense. You know, uh, if you, if, you know, if you get the, if you get a defense in heavy versus a certain package, a, a personnel groupings of yours, you don't want to give them time to, 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 to change that. If you think you can blister it for a couple, three or four plays there. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I you know, and, and obviously they kind of point to the youth and all, and and but you know, I, I think Canada said, look, you, these rookies have been playing together uh, long enough now. These younger guys and all, and and you know, we were able to. It, they they went into the game, I think, thinking that they could maybe do that a little bit more against uh, the Chargers. They got in a situation where uh, game situation dictated they they could and should. And they did. Now, are we going to see that three or four series against uh, uh, the Bengals? I, I kind of doubt it because, I mean, you know, do you really want to put your defense out there that 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 quick as well, too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and from a no-huddle standpoint, it is tougher to do on the road, and Pittsburgh is on the road, and they could do it against the Chargers because that was functionally a home game considering the way the, the, the crowd was, was set up in, in favor of Steelers Nation. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. I mean, if you're going tempo, sometimes that means it's because you're behind. But if, you know, it's a two-minute drill or something like that, end-the-half type thing, you want to be confident in your ability to, to run it and ability to kind of have different plays and not be so static and have such a limited menu to work with. So, you know, there's just growing – confidence and continuity that you would expect with an offense that was really rebuilding itself, especially up front. Uh, Matt was asked, uh, you dusted off the jumbo for the first time this year. How much use have you gotten out of it? He says, we got inside the one there. And I'm, I'm assuming they're, you know, talking about Zach Banner there and all, mm-hmm. but Zach Banner only played the one snap. And uh, if this was a plus or minus like hockey uses, right? Uh, uh, Banner's plus one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you want one snap, one touchdown. That's a good ratio to have. Right. Uh, I'm not a and, – and, and, you know, I, Canada's not going to tell you, you – know, he says players' availability is different every week. We used him, and we're successful on that play. Uh, that said – and I'm not a huge fan of running that tackle eligible out there a bunch because he is a tackle and he's not a tight end. But uh, if, if you have to use Zach Banner a little bit more – and maybe specifically in first down and 10 situations, uh, have at it, man, because this team's got to get better on first down and period. And if that's the way that, that, you know, and, and teams know or defenses are going to know that you're going to want to run it anyway. in a lot of these situations there, I'm not opposed to, to, to Zach Banner getting six, seven, eight snaps a game. If you can run and run successfully with him on the field. Yeah, I mean, I think the emergence of Zach Gentry has just kind of tamped down the need for a tackle eligible because Gentry has that is that bigger blocker tackle like player, but it's obviously you know someone who can be a threat more so than a tackle as a tight end as a receiver. And so that's a good question though. I want to see where the Steelers' um, first down offense is at because they harped on that so much earlier this year. I kind of forgot about it it's uh, not recently. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be good. It's going to be probably at best bottom five. But I do want to see uh, where they're at here on first down this season because they were about. 30th around dead last to about the first month of the season. So let me vamp here and, and load up the numbers. What where would you guess this team's going to rank at in terms of yards per play? I, I, they've got to still be right around 31st or 32nd, yeah. I think, Alex, because, I mean, they, you know, even, even though they've had some successful run rates on first down, once again, it's, it's four, four, four yards in a cloud of dust or, or tire dust in a lot of those situations there. Uh, and I just don't remember them hitting a lot of bigger plays on, on, on first down that will help counteract that number too terribly much. The Raiders are in first place at 6.3 yards per play. Pittsburgh is 31st at exactly four yards and a cloud of dust. 4.0, okay. only team worse are the Houston Texans at 3.7. And the 30th team is Miami at 4.3. So there's a pretty large gap there between, you know, 30 uh, was it be 30th and 31st where Pittsburgh sitting down yet? Pittsburgh. What, what is it? Uh, what is it specifically on first and ten? First and ten. I mean, first I imagine it's not gonna be that much different. That, you know, I'm just including all first down. But let me um, pull, hold on here one yeah. second to uh, put up ten. I mean, it's probably gonna be about the same because there aren't too many first and five or first and you know first and goal. Obviously, can change that a little bit, I suppose. But uh, 
Give me one second. Ooh, I ate too much sugar yesterday, and I don't eat yes. a lot of sugar at all, man. And it it crippled me yesterday. I'm talking, uh, and it really it was the pies that did it. I love mm, apple. What's your pie. go-to pie? Uh, two of them. Yes, uh, apple and <laughs> and pecan. And oh, I grew okay, up in the. Yeah, I grew up in the South too, and and I hated pecans. In fact, we had to go pick pecans for the church every every fall, or whatever they they would fall and all like that. And I just you know, yuck! I hated pecans, and I would not. I didn't eat pecan pie for the first time until I think about five or six years ago. And uh, I thought, and when I did, I thought, oh man, what have I been missing here? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's apple and pecan pie for me. Those are the only two pies that I'll eat. Uh, my y'all, I'll, I'll eat some, you know, some key lime occasionally and all uh, like that. My my wife gets a slice in in a restaurant or something like that, but we don't go out of our way to buy that. But it's pecan and apple for me, and I had not had any pie, and I think well over a year. Of course, you know, having to watch watch some things mm-hmm. with the doctor and all like that, and I got my fill of it yesterday, and that yeah. sugar crippled me. What'd mm-hmm. you find? And that is confirmed pecan, not pecan. So that is a very important distinction there from, yeah. from Dave Bryant. Pecan, uh, 3.9 yards per play on first and 10 specifically. That is also still 31st. Okay. Houston dead last at 3.8. All right. So, so you got to talk about uh, colored socks, uh, pies mm. today. Uh, what else would you the, like? A, the listeners a, are in a, for a treat. <laughs> a glimpse into my messed up <laughs> world. Uh, let's go back to Matt Canada here. And, and yeah, the first down offense, as you mentioned, just has been abysmal. And, and that's, that's largely because of the lack of the big play. Usually it's those big plays that can kind of help skew the numbers upwards for you a little bit. And, um, you know, the run game, not getting those big, big splash plays is, is one reason. And also some negative plays as well. Uh, as why that number's down the way it is. What'd you think about what Troy Aikman had to say? There was some prophetic stuff going on on those broadcasts yesterday. And, what did he say? I don't... Uh, a, and people think that I framed this from Aikman as as, as being a Captain Obvious uh, uh, statement, and it, it sort of is. But uh, uh, here's the quote from Aikman yesterday: "If you are not getting big plays, it's hard to score points." Yeah, I mean Tomlin's um, phrase for that is what uh, chunk plays absolves a lot of execution or takes place the place of a lot of execution, whatever the exact quote is. They're basically saying that when you get the, the big chunk plays, you don't have to worry about the, the, the methodic, perfect 10 to 12 play drive where you're matriculating the ball down the field kind of thing. If you get that big 50 yard chunk play that really changes the tide and gets you in scoring position or a touchdown itself. Yeah. I mean, that can, that solves a lot of problems and a lot of game planning. I'm going to get that in that big giant thug life font. I'm going to get it tattooed across. It'll probably wrap all the way across my back there. But if you're not getting big plays, it's hard to score points. Amen. Yeah, and Pittsburgh's not getting big plays, and they aren't scoring a lot of points. So there you go. All right, uh, we done with uh, Canada there. Uh, Miles Kilbert, what a fantastic young fellow that guy is. Hopefully they can get him back uh, uh, next season there. That guy is a punt blocking machine and i thought his interview yesterday uh was absolutely you don't obviously get to talk uh hear from him too terribly much but uh you want to talk about a dog that guy's a dog yeah uh, i still can't find the last stealer with two block punts in the season if anybody knows let me know because i don't know who it is and I've, i have trouble trying to research some of that that kind of stuff oh well uh, do we know that 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 has been the case though or no do we know what that someone has done two in a right. season I imagine somebody has. I mean, maybe a long time ago when punts weren't as uh, you know crisp as they are now. But uh, I, I could not tell you who or when. But somebody has it out there that 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 it has happened or no? No, I, I don't even know for oh, a fact okay. that it has happened. I'm assuming it's happened just over the course of this team's history. I mean, they've been playing football since 1933. I imagine you know even back maybe in the 60s somebody did did that when punts weren't like I said as crisp and they were kind of messier. But but I, I don't know information on that. So, All right. So what what did you find? You broke that down for the site. Yeah, well, it was interesting because, as you had mentioned, as we talked about, and I did a video breakdown on this for Steelers Depot, it was that re-kick. And so anytime I think you do that re-kick, re-punt, you kind of have a different picture. And so Killebrew, they, it was a totally different scheme. I mean, Killebrew on that first uh, punt that got negated by penalty, Killebrew was at left defensive, at the left side, left end, basically, and was not where he was on the second um, punt. And so there was a really good twist in game run up front with Killebrew and Spillane and Marcus Allen, and they kind of... Uh, they did rush Millette off the edge. He was lined up as that jammer on the outside. He came in late, and that kind of pulled the eyes of the up back and the left tackle for the Chargers protect team, and that kind of helped open up space in the middle for Killebrew to get free. So it's it's not just Killebrew doing that. He talked about that with the media yesterday. That's not just him. Everyone has to execute. So I think that 
that late rush on the outside by Millette kind of pulled the eyes of the Chargers uh, protect team, and that kind of helped Killebrew get free, and he finished the play with a great uh, execution and, and, and finish. So a lot going on in that play, and, and that was just great execution and great scheme. Is he going to become a special teams coordinator? Killebrew? Yeah. Could you see I it? Mean, I mean, he seems like a very smart guy and a passionate guy. So if he wants to, he probably could get into coaching. But I have no idea what uh, what his passion is. I I I, I kind of was sitting there watching that interview, and you know, Bubba Ventrone is the special teams coordinator for the Colts. Did mm-hmm. you know that? Yeah, and uh, was Ross doing some coaching? I don't know if he was, but yeah, I remember Bubba was doing some coaching. Or right, some coaching. And, and Bubba's evidently pretty good at it with uh, with 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 the Colts there, and you know you start to see these kind of these younger, this next generation, I think now you know come along of players that actually played that you watch play now become coaches and all like that, and uh, I I couldn't help but think that uh, uh, potentially uh, Miles Killebrew be, could become. Uh, boy, you want to talk about a, and we knew it right when they signed him as well too. That was a special teams uh, 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 kind of signing there too. You kind of wonder if they can get him back again. Yeah, was that a one-year deal? I I thought it what was it? I don't remember. It's been so I don't, long. I don't, honestly do not remember yet. It's, it's been. I'll find a out while. real quick. Um, one or two year deal. Obviously, it was not a long term deal, but I do not remember how many years that contract was. Hopefully, he could be resigned there. It's yeah, a one year deal. Okay, so yeah, they probably get him back. He seems to be happier playing for Danny Smith. He blocked two punts. That's probably a good, good place you want to stay. Right. Chase Claypool also spoke, and um, I didn't go through that interview as much. I think he talked about he had turf toe, and that was what the injury he was battling with caused him to miss some time. And he's probably still battling it. I'm, I'm guessing it probably it's not completely healed enough week or two but uh, that's the injury that that he's gonna be be dealing with probably for quite some time yeah he's gotten where he's 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 he doesn't give a lot he's learned not to give away a lot of information dur- during his uh interviews there so mm-hmm. there wasn't too terribly much there all right dave uh let's see let's let's uh anything else from any coordinators or players or any interviews that uh, i haven't covered yet i think we got most of it there all right let's preview this steelers Bengals game week 12 a big game here for both sides afc North divisional matchup. Let's start here with the Bengals offense. And so when you look at this Bengals offense, it's again a healthy team. It's it's basically all of the same people that Pittsburgh saw in their week three loss. And so where does your mind go to first when you think about this Bengals offense? Man, stopping the run. Stopping, stopping the run. Uh Joe Mixon really seems to be playing. They 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 really seem to have a lot, e- even more so than uh, the first time they played uh this team back in what was it, week three there. Mm-hmm. Uh they really seem like they've gotten a lot more comfortable with their offensive line play. Uh healthier kind of team overall, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, they have a lot of confidence running the football in all situations right now. So uh, it, it, we've seen this Steelers team kind of have have their hiccups with that front of theirs. We talked about right now. Uh, you know, obviously they don't want Joe Burrow to stand back there and have to throw 40 times a game. And if they can have their run game uh, successful both inside and 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 outside. Uh, that's what they're going to do there. So I think first and foremost, that's where this defense's mind has got to be is stop and run. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're rushing attack for the Bengals. It's not the tops in football. Again, like um, Pittsburgh, they don't get a lot of big plays off of it, but it is still very much, I think, a core part of what they do in Joe Mixon. It's such a good back, and, and they won't. They won't bust off the 60-yard run the way that the Browns or the Ravens would, for example, but they'll consistently get four, four or five yards of carry and just kind of just churn that way. And so that's what you have to do. And certainly Pittsburgh's run defense has been just really poor uh, almost the entire season, but especially recently. And so they have to be better first down, stopping the run, and, and, and obviously forcing those third and long situations. And once again, you know, we talked about Devin Bush earlier in the show. <laughs> You got to know they're going to be trying to get to the second level on him for sure. And uh, they, they are going to try to run, I think, quite extensively up the gut at Bugs, at, at Louder Milk. Uh, you know, run away from, obviously, from, from, from Cam Hayward when they can uh, there. But uh, first and foremost, if I'm the Bengals, I come out and I try to try to establish that run. I try to make sure I get the Steelers uh, in, 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 in those single high looks there because that's when they're more apt to take those shots down the field and, and yeah uh you got a, a kid in jamar chase now that has your attention that was the game uh last year where uh where uh uh james pierre uh uh wasn't ready for uh dadgum 
<laughs> <laughs> or was too concerned about a, a dadgum five yard pass in, in, in a situation where, where uh, it made more sense for, for, for them to go, go deep on him there. But uh, uh, you can bet that the Bengals are probably going to know this time around that they're going to give Jamar Chase more respect, a lot more cushion on the outside. That's going to obviously, if Joe Burrow's patient here, that's going to open up some shorter kind of stop routes, if you will, to chase, I think, on the outside, maybe some back shoulder stuff. They've been u- seemingly using Tyler Boyd a little bit more like they should over over the course of the middle of the field. Uh, T. Higgins gets forgotten about uh, right. in, 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 in all this here, and that's a guy that can really home run you in a hurry or, or, or you know, quick uh, quick slants over the, uh, over the middle and all. So, you know, you, you – when you think about immediately about the, the Bengals wide receiver group right now, I still go Tyler Boyd because he's kind of, you know, generally everything works through him. But since we've obviously seen since the early season and on, they are not afraid to take those shots in, 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 in single high situ- man situations on the outside with Jamar Chase. And then, oh, yeah, you want to try to cover both those things up. Try to try to try to stay on top of uh, 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 T. Higgins on the other side there, and don't forget my boy C. J. Uzama. <laughs> I was waiting for him. <laughs> uh, that that guy is probably one of the most underrated tight ends in the NFL right now, uh, mm-hmm. and we haven't even gotten to how they can effectively use Joe Mixon. And and we talked the other day, I think about Evans out of the backfield. They do a good job of mixing those guys up. Uh, they uh, as we saw, I think previewing the game back in week three. They'll go empty in a heartbeat on you. They are not afraid to go empty on you. And yeah. and uh, so I think you're going to see a little bit of all of it. But I, I, I do think it starts with stopping the run and then keeping a lid on everything. I, you have to make this Bengals offense go 12 plays, not commit any penalties, not give up any sacks in this one. And and once again, the big difference in this game, this time around versus the week three game is, is oh yeah, you have Highsmith and, and Watt in this one. Right. And those two really have to have a good game yeah that's going to be a big difference in this one or at least hopefully that it will be getting more pressure because they got zero pressure and a bird didn't have to throw the football much in that first meeting but even when he did they, they just wouldn't his jersey didn't have to get washed after that game like they just never touched him at all um yeah i mean it, their motion rate overall is about middle of the pack a little bit below but i think they've done it more lately they use a lot of motion use it effectively against the raiders for example in that offensive you know explosion getting 32 points in that game so um you know i think pittsburgh's had a really tough time the last couple of weeks adjusting to motion and communicating and kind of getting set detroit and um uh the charges both gave i think pittsburgh fits uh in that regard so i think you're gonna see a lot of motion in this and and, and you're right about jamar chase defenses have certainly given him more attention since that 200 yard game he put up against baltimore his last three weeks have been really quiet he's only got one catch longer than 20 yards and that's a 21 yard game so pittsburgh gonna have to certainly give him attention because if you do single that guy up um the steelers corners are not particularly fast not not joe hayden and so that's going to be an issue but you're right there are so many other weapons boy such an impact player on third down uzama's got Five touchdowns this season, the second most of any tight end, only behind Hunter uh, Hunter Henry, the same as number of uh, uh, touchdowns as Pat Frymuth has. And so there's a lot of weapons. Higgins, as you said, a very underrated player that's, I think, playing better as of late. So even if you take away Jamar Chase, there's still plenty of guys for Burrow to, 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 to throw to. And, you know, you go back to that game. What do you, what do you have, like eight, only 18 attempts and like, I don't know, 20 mm-hmm. dropbacks? Um, uh uh, in in that first game against the Steelers, I mean it, it, that's ideal for them, right? I mean, the, right. The, uh, especially when 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 Watt and Highsmith are back uh, back this week here, you got to make that guy drop back thirty or more times in this game uh, at at a minimum, I I think. Now here's a lot another thing that a lot of people you get you get away from these games, you just remember that that those those missed what fourth down plays uh that the Steelers kind of bungled there the Steelers mm-hmm. turned the football over what two or three times in that game uh they had an interception there near the end of the first quarter there the uh the uh the Bengals capitalized on that so some po- po- you know we haven't used the word putos in a while but uh uh putos there for the points off of turnovers for for the Bengals early on uh, after the Steelers first interception in that game uh the end of the half score that they had was a just, you know, we talked about that how many different times about James Pierre just not knowing the situation and giving up the uh, giving up the home run 
uh, late in the first half on that one there. They only had five possessions, true possessions, I think, in that uh, in, 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 in that first half there. And they scored on two of them, and one of them off a turnover, the other off of a big play that just shouldn't have happened. So there's 14 points that they had right there. Uh, they also had another interception uh, midway through the uh, third quarter in that game that they – Three plays, 19 yards, touchdown. Mm-hmm. So the Steelers helped facilitate them in that in that loss by turning the football over there. So that that's another thing. Not giving that that Bengals offense a short field in this one is is a key key element to it. So you know, uh, other than that, how did you enjoy the play? But uh, <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln. But in, in, in short, if you don't turn the football over there. And you convert a couple of fourth downs, even without cut you three of your stars in that game. It's it, it's a lot closer game. Sure, and and Pittsburgh to their credit, has done a much better job taking care of the football. At least when Ben's started, of course. No, actually, this is the longest in season uh, streak Ben's ever had not throwing and throwing a pick. It has not thrown one in five games. His longest streak ever in one individual season. So hopefully that continues. They're gonna be coming late. after you for that. I know didn't. everyone yells at me for it as if I. <laughs> Can control these things. He's going to yeah. throw a pick at some point. The streak's not going to be 27 games. I'm sorry. So we'll see what happens. And make but, no um, mistake, he should have had an interception or two in yeah. that string anyway. But yeah, usually interceptionless streaks usually should have been broken. You know, for any quarterback at some point in that mm-hmm. process. But you know, what do they call near interceptions? Call yeah, complete passes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Quick, a uh, couple other notes. This Bengals offense has really come alive. I mean, they didn't score more than 27 points. I think their first five games of the season. Four of their last five games, they've been over 30. So this offense, even with Chase being more subdued and kind of taken away has really opened things up. And then although we talk about the deep ball so much with Jamar Chase, there's a lot of quick hitting, easy kind of reads and concepts. They're going to run spot. They're going to run Hank. They're going to run dragon, which are, you know, curl flat, slant flat combinations. A lot of quick hitters, especially to chase. They get him backside. They run some four by one, which is very much in vogue. Uh, formation, four guys to one side, one, you know, the, the backside player away. Except the Steelers. Um, the Steelers won't run that. Well, except they? the Steelers, they don't do that. But uh, some of the more, Fun offense has done that. And they've done some other fun stuff, man. They ran in week nine, they ran a flea flicker against the Browns. And then against the Raiders last week, they ran fake. a fake flea flicker. Yep. Yeah, where they faked the toss back and, and Mason took off and got, I don't know, 12 yards out of the play. So uh, new OC, you know, Bill Lazor was like such a very old school vanilla OC. They got Callahan in there now and they're doing a lot of fun stuff on tape. And uh, with, with, with Watt and Highsmith back, you would think that they're going to want, uh, when they do pass, it'll be a lot of quicker stuff, right? Because they don't, they, don't, you know, they don't want Burrow back there uh, mm-hmm. uh, taking hits and all like that. So another thing that, that scares me, and I know you're probably kind of concerned about too, is what's going to happen when they do go empty with a guy like Chris Evans or whatnot uh, or, or, you know, uh, CJ Uzama and all like that. Who 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 are you going to cover him up with? Uh, uh, you're going to try to get a lot of option route uh, situations, I think here, or some some quick read slants to a guy like uh, Evans and stuff like that. They do a good job with rub routes and stuff like mm-hmm. that, especially against man type situations. There, uh, I think you have less concern about Joe Burrow running with the football than you are, let's say, a Herbert, but. Uh, Make no mistake about it, though, if you're going to play heavy man and if Burrow's able to pick it up in, in situations the way Herbert was, and, and this is another thing that Keith Butler talked about uh, yeah. uh, during his press conference was, you know, Herbert really, really got a good read on what they were doing. They, they, they weren't mixing enough stuff up there, and they were kind of showing, I think, that they were going to be in a lot of man, four-man front situations there. Although they weren't playing quarterback runs, they might as well been have been because he just had a good read that, look, they're going to be in man situations. If this part's in this gap there, I'm going to just go take off with it. Yeah, and Butler seemed to lament. He said maybe we should have mixed things up a bit, done something different than play so much man, something we talked about, you know, Monday and Wednesday. And so tough situation. I, I, I'm to not in. mad about it, though, overall, because they were just, you know, and Mike Tomlin put it bad. They needed 12 players out there to get yeah. anything done, what they wanted to get done. They were they were really in a damned if you do, damned if you did, didn't situation there. Sure. I, I would have liked to have seen them maybe bring more pressure, uh, maybe, but I mean, even the early, unless they mixed up the kind of pressure blitzes mm-hmm. and all that they were doing, as you pointed out in your charting and on in your talk the other day, what thirty something percent uh, 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 numbers sit in that in the first half there, they weren't they weren't even getting close to them no. with with that. No, there was, the timing wasn't there. It was new guys. They just there was no chemistry in terms of how those blitzes kind of get timed and how they hit. And so yeah, I mean they. 
nothing really would have worked, but you would have liked to at least see, see maybe the adjustment of the attempt to do something different other than just doing the same thing over and over again. Because, of course, when you do that, you get the same results over and over again. And then, you know, new people, you, do you want to put too much on, on on them and have the miscommunication, which they ended up having anyway? L- <laughs> there was like, a lot more miscommunication in that game than people understand. Mm-hmm. Like, it was not just a touchdown to Mike Williams. There was a lot of miscommunication in that uh, game. Re- recap some, some of the, and, 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 and tell people where they can find that. Yeah, there's a video on Seals Depot. If I have to search it, just uh, type in uh, – I forget what the title was. Just type in the word watch and kind of scroll down a little bit, and you'll see one of the videos on that. Um, I forget what was the title of that video. Um, probably about miscommunication. But, but yeah, just just small stuff, big stuff, guys not being in the right gaps, guys being late to line up. Um, Trey Norwood busted a coverage earlier in the game at the end of the first half. There was a cross where the came wide open. He didn't take it. He should have taken it. Um, just just small stuff that, that weren't as gaudy as, of course, the, the game-winning touchdown that L.A. had. But, um, yeah, it was called New Faces Lead to Miscommunication for Steelers Defense. It's about a 12-minute video, and some of it's small, some of it's bigger stuff, but um, just kind of talks about, you know, again, it's New Faces. It's it's Delonte Scott and Archibong and, you know, those guys playing and, and trying to figure stuff out, and that's a really tough spot to be in. Absolutely. So, uh, once again, hopefully, you know, hey, hopefully they get Hayden back. You know, and obviously Watt and Minka uh, back, you know, that, that'll that help shore up a little bit of that. Louder Milk, have him back on the field there. Maybe you get Carlos Davis and, and Bugs swapping some snaps off, get Mundo off the field there. A lot of ifs, a lot of maybes in there, but uh, uh, at least that's the way things are shaping up right now. We'll see what the uh, what, 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 what Saturday moves and all uh, uh, wind up showing us here. All right, Dave, let's move over to the Bengals defense and talk about that group. And again, healthy team. I think it's a very similar personality and group of guys, the names, the faces, the scheme, very similar to the week three games. There's been a lot of time passed between that first matchup. Now, the Steelers are a much different team in terms of you know health-wise and faces and talent and execution than where the Bengals are. They're kind of still the same team, and I mean that in a good way overall for, for Cincinnati there. I think they play good run defense. Um, they're going to play a lot of zone coverage. They're not going to blitz a lot, but they got a good front four, and that's kind of where it starts for them. That that front four is kind of what makes this whole defense go. And look, I know the numbers say that they're 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 good against the run. You probably shouldn't try to run on those guys, but you know the Steelers are are are, are, are you know they have built this thing so they can try to run. Mm-hmm. And do you want do you want Hendrickson and 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 those edges teeing off on your tackles all game? Probably not. Uh, if the Steelers are going to do anything, uh, you're going to see once again heavy, heavy RPO usage uh, in 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 this. A lot of quick, uh, quick passes. You know, I think you need to probably really consider if you get the right box count looks. Uh, you know, heavier in there, running some some of those wide receiver screens out on the edge and try to try to bust a play maybe that way uh, in this and kind of using that as a run game alternative there. But uh, I, I know the numbers say don't try to run on the Bengals, but I think you try to run on the Bengals. And I personally, you know, I think this is a perfect opportunity with, with not having to worry about get, getting Eric Ebron some snaps. You have really what is – quite honestly, still probably your best blocking tight end <laughs> on the 53-man roster in Kevin Radar, even though I don't think he's going to get but maybe three or four snaps. I, I would consider using him a little bit more in this game. And I, I you know, maybe put Zach Banner out there for, for a couple more snaps and all. Mm-hmm. I would try to go heavier on these guys. And they did that in that first matchup. I, right? I would, the worst thing I, done. I would just, I, I know, I know, I know it. I know it says otherwise there, but I, I, you know, I don't think you want to just sit back there and have Ben Roethlisberger throw 45 times a right. game. Well, I, I don't think those are the only two options. You can run the ball out of more 11 personnel uh, because if you go heavy, they're going to go heavy and they're still doing five defensive linemen packages when the Browns are running a lot of troll personnel and they were going, you know, five D linemen in the game and the Browns have a lot better run game than what the, uh, uh, than what the Steelers do. So I think you, I think you need to run the football. I think you have to do that every single game for this offense to thrive and for this team to win. But I think if you go heavy, Again, as you said on Wednesday, I think maybe you try to spread things out occasionally heavy, but you're going to have to probably commit to run and heavy sometimes as well. And that just proved to not be successful in that first matchup. I think you're just running into a brick wall if you attempt that. So I think you got to run the ball, but I think you don't have to do it out of of those heavy packages. Well, I mean, they're going to have to run the football with 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 uh, you know some success in this one period if they're going to win this game. Yeah, no doubt. And 
uh, I, I wouldn't be opposed to them trying to at least come out heavy and see if they, they, they could try to do that. Yeah, I would try it once. If it doesn't work, then I'm scrapping yeah. it. But uh, but I hear what you're saying. And, and maybe I think this team this team is a better – they're better running the football now than they were in week three. So I think you have a better chance at having more success because you're, you're just time and this line getting better and getting cohesion and, and things like that. Um, so maybe there's a better chance for it. But I'm still leery of the idea because of the way the Bengals respond to it. I mean, look, you know, obviously be smart with your runs, too, you know, uh, and, and, and personnel groupings. Obviously, if you throw out a, a 12 or a 22 out there and you're constantly running out of it, out of out of out of out of uh, uh, non-detached situations there, you know, but I mean, you could do different things with the personnel out there and, and try to catch them off guard with, you know, perfect time for that will, a perfect time to throw to maybe Gentry, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, I, whenever he's on the field there once again, I don't think they're going to put Raider on the field much mm-hmm. of any, but I, I would certainly consider it if, 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 if you still consider him one of your top two uh, run blocking tight ends in there and all, but, uh, uh, and it goes without saying you're going to catch them in certain situations where they're going to play some single high and Jesse Bates has not had the best season overall. Uh, I think, a couple, you know, I think their quarter corners are beatable, especially with a guy. I mean, uh, uh, and Deontay Johnson's playing some really, really good football right now. So, and you didn't have him. You know, they, they didn't get to play against him in that first meeting between the two teams there. So uh, I would make sure that Deontay Johnson gets plenty of targets, mm-hmm. uh, not only via some quick slants and all, but 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 down the field as well. Yeah, I will say probably the key matchup to watch is Kendrick Green against Larry Ogunjobi. Uh, Ogunjobi schooled Green that first meeting, and so Green's got to be a lot better, especially if they're going to – probably not going to run a lot of power, I suppose, because you don't really have anyone to pull at this point, but um, just some of those back blocks Green was really struggling with. And so overall, just dealing with big guys up front like EJ Reader, the one-tech, Ogunjobi, the three-tech, Kendrick Green's got to be a lot better in this game. You got Turner dealing with whatever he's dealing with with an ankle, so you're probably not going to have too much uh, uh, right to left power, right? Mm-hmm. So and Hague pulling. Hague, Hague's pulled his first snap at right guard right. against uh, whatever game that was he came in. He pulled him, but uh, he's not, you know, he's more of a base block, combo block, double team kind of guy than pulling and getting out in space. It sure would be nice to see if you can maybe get a get McFarlane a helmet and – uh, get him it's out. It's gonna happen. No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I, it's concerning at this point too. I think you know, unless there's something going on, are we gonna get something from? You know, I don't think Matt Canada is gonna slip and and tell us that maybe he's not getting the X and O and O's out of this as well either. But I mean, Matt Canada knows this kid, right? I mean, knows him from Maryland. So, uh, you would think, you know, the level of 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 how they knew some of these kids before they draft them, I just, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. It's just, it's very concerning right now that you can't have McFarlane out there on the field with some sort of, you know, uh, thunder and lightning type, type situation and get the ball, get him a good four or five touches in a game. Cause that gets Nige off the field. It still gives you a player that can, that can, you know, create an explosive play for you. You would hope in those situations. And it's just, it's very concerning that, that, you know, at this point, coming back from injury, he's only been active one game. He has seven touches so far. He uh, still don't I, – I don't even think has close to 100 offensive snaps played at this point, not even close. And uh, what's, what's that say about him at this point? Yeah, I mean, because you have to assume that Canada basically gave the blessing to draft him. And they probably turned to him and saying, like, tell us about this guy because it was COVID and he couldn't go to the pro days and stuff like that. And so, like – Canada was the authority figure on, on getting McFarland to Pittsburgh, and now he can't get a helmet, which, as you said, what does that say about – and again, the injury, the moving train, you know, they draft Najee, a lot of things change, but still, you know, the guy can't can't suit up at all. I mean, second-year jump. Okay, we get it. Uh, red shirt year uh, uh, last season for, for the Steelers because of underclassmen, and, and, uh, but, I mean, come on. Matt Canada knows this kid. He used him in an offense there uh, at, at Maryland. Uh, you you can't tell me you can't figure out a way to get this guy on the field for eight plays and and running you know twice and throw to him twice in those eight plays you know yeah uh, any other thoughts here on the Bengals defense anything else you want to talk about and look at boy that uh, that 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 Logan he he's something man yeah. uh, he might uh, he might be the uh, one of the more underrated inside linebackers in the game right now. 
Yeah, he's got four interceptions. He's got more interceptions than the entire secondary of the Bengals combined. He's got four of them, two of them coming in that first Steelers game. One of them, I mean, Ben threw right at him. So, I mean, it was right. easy to interception in the world, but there's still interceptions still count. And so they, they've been dying for a good off ball linebacker for so long. They had some guys that would play like Nick Vigil, but he was a below average talent, just had a lot of tackles. But Logan Wilson's the real deal. He's a good athlete. You know, he, he's a well rounded uh, guy for him coming out of the senior bowl out of Wyoming, had a really strong week down in Mobile, and he's playing. Just some, some really good ball. The one guy to go after is number, number uh, 57, Jermaine Pratt. I think he's right. the one that you want to try to pick on. He seems to be struggling more with processing and consistency and things like that. You know, you go back once again to that to that game, and yeah, uh, you know, the Steelers got beaten. 14 points is a huge loss for, for Steelers over the years when it comes to that stuff. But you look at uh, after that uh, that last uh, interception that Ben threw, the, the second one was the one that he threw right to Logan, was it? Because the first one, wasn't the first one, the tipped one at the line of scrimmage that Logan made the nice play on, or do I have them Six. backwards? I can't remember for sure. One of them, though, was Ben throwing it right into the numbers of 55. All right, and then they, they uh, the Bengals turn around, and that was midway through the third quarter, and then they got the quick touchdown because they, they got the ball at the 19, at, at the Steelers' 19, so it was like a three-play uh, quick, uh, I think that was the pass over the middle there uh, uh, for the, the for Chiefs. the uh, uh, Yeah, to, uh, to, yeah. To, to to chase on that one there. Uh, but after that, their next, uh, uh, their next three possessions in that game were three and out, three and out, three and out. So, you know, the Steelers definitely had a chance to, to, to still hang around in that game there. And, and you know, I, I made sure to point this out in my terrible take yesterday there. They did not have T.J. Watt. They did not have Hightower. And they did not have Deontay Johnson. And hopefully they're going to have – they should have all three of those guys there. Uh this is still I don't you know, I don't want to I don't want to undersell the Bengals here because I think they really have been impressive the last several weeks on offense. You know they had the bye week they they were good, kind of rough going into that going into the bye week there, but they they really seem to be clicking on 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 all cylinders on both sides of the football uh, right now. So it is imperative that uh, the Steelers stop the run first and foremost. They're going to have to have a few turnovers once again. Uh, the Steelers are to 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 get some short fields here, but uh, this should be a winnable game for them. All right, Dave, before we pick the, the steelers Bengals game, let's uh, pick the rest of Week 11. And I believe, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, but you were 3-0, and I think, Ooh. on the day on Thanksgiving yesterday. Right, ship it, as you like to yeah, say? Yeah, ship it. Uncle Dave was on fire uh, uh, yesterday. But uh, Turkey Weekend is here. My bookie, they're giving you plenty of reason to be thankful. Uh, and you already got uh, some reason there on Thursday. And don't we have some Saturday games this week, right? Do we? Uh, there's, is that Christmas or is that is that Thanksgiving as well? I thought we have a. I, might I thought it was wrong. just Christmas. Let me look here real quick here. Uh, no, days are running. Uh, no, no Saturday games this week. I thought I saw a, 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 a promo, but uh, only Sunday games this week here. But uh, uh, let's see. Before you get in, get your wager in. Set yourself up for success by doubling your first deposit when you're using promo code Terrible. That's promo code Terrible at my bookie. That's promo code Terrible to double your initial deposit all the way up to one thousand dollars. So you won't need to break the wishbone to be one to come out ahead here with my bookie. Feast risk free today with my bookie and make sure you stick around uh, for seconds as they gear up what should be a fun Black Friday with tons of odds boost that will have you have your belly and your pockets full. So bet anything, anytime, anywhere at mybookie.ag. And once again, I, I hopefully I got everybody's uh, holiday off to a great start there because I gave you three winners on on, on on Turkey Day there. And how'd you do on those three three games? Two and one, I want to say. I think I got the Bears. The Bears won, but they didn't cover, right? I think was that the outcome uh, there. But... Yeah, the, the, the Lions covered that. The Lions covered, yeah, yeah. So I think I went I think I went two and one. But uh, let's hopefully bring a more more holiday cheer here with the rest of our picks, Dave. What do we got here to start things off for week 12? Uh, let me pull them up here. I didn't have that uh, line open there. Here we go. Starting on Sunday, Tennessee Titans at the New England Patriots. This one should be a good one. The Patriots at home laying seven to the Titans. Mm, it's a fairly big line there. The Patriots are playing really good football. I'm going to say Rabel against the pass. I'm going to say the Titans cover Patriots win. Uh, I'm going to say the Patriots run. Belichick likes to. 
teach lessons, I think, here. Mm. And I think he's going to try to teach uh, Vray- Vrabel a lesson here. Give me the Patriots, and I'll lay the seven points in this one. Uh, I know you'll be tuned in for this one. New York Jets at the Houston Texans. Mm, uh, really. Houston laying two and a half against the J-E-T-S Jets, Jets, Jets. Zach Wilson starting because they have no other quarterbacks. Um, I don't know. Wilson, you just don't trust the turnovers. Give me the Texans. Give me the Jets to win this outright. Play that money line. Uh, Jets going to win this one on the road. Beat the Texans. Uh, Eagles at the Giants. Uh, the Giants at home plus three and a half points. Oh, give me the Eagles. Really, it's plus three. Uh, mm-hmm. Give me the Eagles for sure. Their, their run game, I, I kind of dogged them for the lack of run game. Some of it's Jalen Hurts, but the run game has really improved, and, and the Giants are just a, a hot mess. You know, I, Hurts is not playing bad football right now. And mm-hmm. uh, using his light, using his mobility uh, when, when he should and, and seem to making some good decisions there, I will lay the three and a half points with the Eagles on the road here uh, against the Giants. Tampa Bay uh, at the Colts. Colts won a high school teams in the in the in the in the league right now tough tough t- test here at home against tom brady and the buccaneers uh plus three for the colts at home yeah i think the bucks cool them off i'm gonna go tampa bay yeah i'm with you i think uh i think tampa go uh, go goes there and and gets the win and wins by more than three so i will lay the three with you there falcons on the road against the jacksonville jaguars Jaguars plus two at home against the Falcons. This is another one I know you're going to have on a, on a smaller TV there in your office. Yeah, all the TVs I have. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Give me the Falcons. Yeah, I don't know what what way of um, Matty Ice is banged up a little bit there. And, boy, just brutal sacks that he uh, uh, gave up the other day there. Uh, yeah, I, I'll take Matty Ice. I, I know I should, but I'll lay the, lay the two on the road with the Falcons over the Jaguars. Carolina Panthers at the Miami Dolphins. Uh, the, Cam Newton definitely back. Uh, Dolphins plus two at home against the Panthers. Give me the road teams. Road teams did well yesterday, right? Give me the road team here, the Carolina Panthers with, with Cam Newton. That offense just feels more explosive, more potent, just more energy. The, the defense has played well overall. They got a good DC over there. Um, give me Carolina. I'm with you. Give me the Panthers on the road uh, to to uh, to beat the Dolphins. I'll lay the two with you there. That brings us to the Chargers at the Broncos. Uh, Broncos plus two and a half at home against the Chargers. Broncos have been a bit of an underrated team this season, but man, watching that Chargers unit with the way Herbert is, the arm talent that he has, uh, I'm going with the road team again, so give me L.A. I will go with you there. I will lay the two and a half uh, Chargers on the road against the Broncos. The Vikings at the 49ers here. 49ers laying three at home against the Vikings. This should be a decent game. Yeah, it should be. Um, I think I think the 49ers have kind of refound their identity, their scheme better. There's more rhythm to their offense. Uh, give me San Francisco. I just think, uh, yeah, and I think the 49ers have the slightly better defense of the two there right now. Uh, I'll take the 49ers lay to three points against the Vikings with you there. Rams on the road against the Packers. This should be another good game. Packers at Lambeau Field plus one point. Mm, it's almost a pick them. I mean, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good game. Just so Stafford, Roger, Stafford. Stafford versus Rodgers, right? Yeah, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i always been a Rodgers fan. You know, I think it's one of the obviously best quarterbacks of this generation. Um, I, I think they're getting healthier. I think Aaron Jones might be coming back in this one. So give me, give me, give me uh, the Packers. Yeah, this is this is tough. You know what? I will take the Rams on the road. I will lay the point there. So At I, Lambeau. Yeah, I think the Rams win this by a field goal. Uh, boy, uh, Crosby, Mason Crosby, not having – this might be it for Mason Crosby with the Packers here. Uh, they, he keeps missing some some makeable field goals. So I'll take the Rams, lay the point there. Uh, Sunday night, uh, a big – another AFC North battle, big one. Browns on the road against the Ravens. Uh, the Ravens lay in three and a half. This is a this is a must win for the Browns almost it feels like right because they've lost what what have the Browns done in the division so far? It's a good question. Uh, I think they've had their their struggles and they're they're still in the basement right now. They are they lost to the Steelers uh, and they beat the Bengals so they are one and two in, or one and one in the division there. As we've talked about, boy, you you. And this year in this division, you better win your divisional games here. So uh, uh, Ravens uh, are favored in this one. 
at home laying three and a half over the Browns. You just look at Baker Mayfield. He's so beat up. He's struggling so much. I mean, I like the Browns' identity. I think they're the best identity in football of any team. But uh, I think the Ravens are getting more big plays. I'm assuming Lamar's playing this week. That's a pretty safe bet. So, yeah, it's a big win. Uh, yeah, Cleveland, they lose, lose this one. They drop to 6-6. Six and six, But I'm going Baltimore. Boy, uh, this thing could get interesting by Monday morning, right? Because if the Steelers beat the Bengals and the Browns beat the Ravens. Steelers are right back in the. Everybody's still right back in the thick of this thing, right? Yeah, it's it's going to go down to week seventeen, week eighteen. I mean, that's how the North is going to be determined. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen with 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 the Browns this week, though. Give me the Ravens late at three and a half points there. The other game, uh, I think the Monday night game, Seattle at the Washington Football Team. This is a pick 'em. Yeah, I, I looked the other day. I didn't realize Seattle was three and seven this season. I know you know Russell was, uh, Russell Wilson missed those couple of weeks, but still three and seven for Seattle just feels so weird to see. Um, Washington's playing decent football for him. Where's it at? Is this in Seattle? That's at Washington? Washington. Yeah, give me the home team. Give me Washington. Give me Seattle. So I'll go to the opposite side of the fence here. Right. Uh, uh, then that that takes us back to the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road against the Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals have not swept the Steelers since. 2009 mm. uh and the last time the Bengals won three in a row was what what did i say 1990 Nine, i think 89 90 90 and that was yeah and that um, was bubby brister and boomer esiason mm. the last time forget. the Bengals won three in a row during the regular season well, not obviously not one regular season, but uh, went from eighty nine to ninety uh, there. In fact, I think uh, at at one point there, I think that was the final in nineteen ninety after sweeping the Steelers uh, that year. I think that was the end of like five or six games in a row that the Bengals had beaten the Steelers. In. Yeah, I was gonna say because there was that eighty nine game where they got beat what forty one to ten. It was after that fifty one nothing loss that Pittsburgh had against the Browns in the opener, and and so yeah. It's been a while. Um, what's the line on this one? Four. Bengals by four right now at that home. Move? That move at all this week? Yeah, it seemed like it started like four and a half and then dipped down to three and a half. And so it, it's about around a half a point all over the place there. Well, I'll go first here. And I, I don't know what direction you're going in. I wasn't sure who were you going to pick here. I wonder if we're going to have – I don't know if we've had different picks this season in terms of you picked the Steelers and I didn't or vice versa. Um I think the Bengals are a very good team. I think the Steelers certainly still have their problems, but you think about a Steelers team that's going to get healthier from where they were last week and where they were in that first Bengals matchup. You're getting T.J. Watt, getting Alex Highsmith. Hopefully you should have a better pass rush for sure. Um, and, and obviously this is a big game for both sides, but this one means a lot to Pittsburgh, and I think they're just going to find a way to, to win that tough road game. So I got Pittsburgh winning this one 24-23 Thank, in large part thanks to the reinforcements coming back on defense. Yeah, uh, and I, I've I've tried to look at this at, uh, several different ways here, and I, I I keep going back to the fact that man, if they don't turn that ball over a couple times against Cincinnati that first game, if they had Watt, Highsmith, and 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 Deontay Johnson there, what what would the outcome of that game uh, have been? Uh, you know what sold me on this is Mike Tom and the way he just kind of underscored this thing the other day mm-hmm. uh, yeah. in, in Tuesday. They they know that they, if they're going to if they're going to make the playoffs this year if they're going to have a chance at winning this division they cannot lose both games to the Bengals here. Uh, you got a couple of tough tough games. This is a tone setter because really I'm not going to have a lot of confidence next week against. Uh, Steelers against the Ravens if the Steelers don't win this game period uh, this is a this is a turning point game in the season for this team right now uh uh you know they obviously missed ha- you know having a couple of these guys last week against the Chargers it showed it's going to be up to the defense to to take the football away a couple times up for the offense to to make sure to to capitalize I believe Mike Tomlin here. I think he's going to have this team ready. I don't think it's going to be pretty. It never is when it, when mm. it comes to this team. But no way do they let the Bengals sweep them, right? I mean, no way. <laughs> I, uh, so. I had the Steelers winning this one 23-20 to 20 on the road. I don't know if it's some sort of late turnover or what, but my gut just will not let me think that this team will lose back-to-back, you know, 
uh, or, or two games on a road to the Bengals. If they do, we have reached a new era, you know, uh, mm-hmm. for sure. And then I really am going to wonder about this team against the Ravens the following week as well, too. You just cannot lose these divisional games this year, especially to the Bengals there. So 23 to 20, that's the way I have this going for the Steelers. Was this a hard game to pick for you? Because I wrestled with this quite a bit. I, I, I this did. And because, okay. No, well, I mean, I I, I started go, I went back and watch, rewatched the game against the Bengals the, the first time there. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you start thinking, man, well, I wonder what, if they had Deontay in this game, if they had, you know, this, this that, and the other, if they had Watt in that game. I mean, that's your best defensive player <laughs> over there. Sure. And not only that, you know, you were missing Highsmith on the other side in that game. Uh, who was he? he had uh, 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 Tuska, Tuska right? in that game and Jameer, uh, and Jam- yeah. Jameer Jones in that game, right? Did you have Jameer Jones in that game? I think you did, didn't you? I can't read this season's gone on had, too long. You had Melvin, Tuska, and Jameer Jones, if memory serves me, in that game. Jameer Jones no longer part of your your team. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tuska obviously you did you know was was new, fairly new, still to the team at at that time there. And uh, yeah, uh, that that played a lot in this. Just knowing that mm-hmm. they're thinking that they're going to get Watt and and, and 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 Deontay obviously back for this game and High Smith as well too there. But I I did wrestle a little with it a little bit there because this 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 Bengals offense looks impressive on tape. Yeah, and they're just a good team overall. It's certainly not the Bengals of old. Like there's real staying power with this team, not a flash in the pan, like even some Marvin Lewis coach team. So it'll be a close one for sure. And those close games come down to just who makes that last play. And so hopefully it's Pittsburgh. We both think it will be. All right. What else we got going on on, on, on this Friday? You guys got the uh, preview post up already. Mm-hmm. A, lot, a lot of film study in there as well, too. Yeah, have the scouting reports up on the Bengals. I mean, it's usually a bit briefer because it's a lot of the same stuff as um, the first matchup, but certainly some still new things to key in on there. I think there's some players speaking with the media later today. Who is it? It's uh, is Najee speaking like usual. I think yeah, Minka's- Najee and uh- Watt, and uh, I think Minka's speaking today as well, too. Okay. So good to hear from those guys, and so we'll cover that for sure. And come back on Monday, of course, before we close out today's show day, let's get to some reader emails. Yeah, let's do it here. Let's see if we got a few in here on the holidays. I forgot all about that portion. I was about ready to wrap it up. Uh, huh. let's and by the way, if you're listening, and I don't know the timeline on this, but uh, I'll do, I'm doing my mailbag today. I didn't want to do it during Thanksgiving because I wanted to eat some turkey, and probably no one was going to ask a question on Thanksgiving. So my Steelers mailbag will go up today at 2.30 Eastern time. Uh, Bryce writes in, hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving. I'll, uh, I'll be, he'll, he says he'll be in Cincinnati for the big game. And he can't wait. Question about defense. When you watch the Steelers defense on tape, how much of their secondary play starts with getting their hands and rerouting eligible receivers. I love the idea of challenging youth wide receiver and tight ends with getting hands on them because it's an element of football they have to adjust to, and it just doesn't allow them uh, to, to just get anywhere they want to unimpeded from my angle. I don't see the Steelers doing this with great regularity. They don't, they don't do it. I mean, they're playing a lot more uh, zone, uh, zone this year, right? I haven't looked at the numbers lately. They're kind of hard to find. But in the study I did earlier this year, they were playing a lot more zone, and I imagine that's still uh, the case. Yeah, they don't do a lot. I mean, most of the NFL does not do a lot of rerouting these days because it's just so tough to do with the five-yard chuck and penalties and teams that spread things out and these crazy talents. So, yeah, I would say Pittsburgh doesn't do it really well or effectively, but I don't know if that's – I think it's relatively typical across the NFL these days. Uh, Todd Gensler writes in, I uh, hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, regarding the hiring of assistant coaches, why don't we pers- pursue top-tier people? Everyone knows the Steelers are very patient with their personnel. Are we not – getting the looks from our from our ride we keep hiring mediocre in-house staff or is it because Tomlin's arrogance and desiring control am I missing something always look forward to this podcast as you true or truly best Todd I think you're just uh, I think you're uh, you're you're just kind of looking at this that oh man this is a crappy couple of seasons here uh look they went out and got a guy like munchak i mean i think that speaks volumes a couple of years ago when they when they did that uh but but coaching hires are usually all about relationships right alex and you know coaches like to hire who they who they like i don't i don't view this as a, a, a tomlin uh arrogance look they when they got todd haley a, a, several years ago he was coming off of being uh a, a, a coordinator for the cardinals right 
Yeah, or was it the uh, chief, uh, the uh, head coach of the Chiefs? I forget the timeline. Well, he there. was at one time the the Chiefs, but what what uh, did the Steelers face? Well, that's right. Uh, Haley went from uh, Cardinals air offense coordinator to the Chiefs head coach, and then uh, where was then he at? Pittsburgh? It was yeah. with the Pittsburgh right after that. Right. Actually. I mean, that was yeah. considered a, a you know th- them you know a, a top, kind of a top hire at the time, right? Yeah, um, it was definitely a notable out of house one. I mean, Pittsburgh does not have a lot of movement with their coaching staff in general, so there's just probably less opportunity to do so. I get the point there, and you and you're right. Coaching is about relationships, but there's probably you know a line to that where you don't want it to be solely about relationships. And Tomlin has been fairly heavy, although I think the more recent hires like Alfredo Roberts and um, you know are less about connections to Tomlin. Is just getting guys who who are kind of you know really good at their jobs, but. Um, Todd, I appreciate the question, but that felt like a very loaded question there. So I think you kind of have your answer. You're already kind of sticking to on, on what you what you think about these. Yeah, it, it does seem like Todd's got a, uh, a, a, a predisposed kind of attitude towards it there. Uh, let's see here. Lenny writes in, Dave, I know there's been a lot of criticism lately about the red zone play calling and how we need to run the ball more more often. However, to me, it seems that Ben is not on the same page as the receivers. I see a lot of teams that pass inside the five and score. Is there any st- statistical ranking on where we actually rank on scoring TDs in the red zone? I also would love to see Alex break down uh, what's happening on the routes. Are the receivers not getting separation? Obviously, in the red zone, Ben needs to hit these guys right right out of their break. Thanks, uh, Lenny. He says, long-time listener, never miss a podcast. Yo, know, I, I, as bad as this team started the other night against the Chargers and, and, and yada, yada, I didn't run some situations there in the red zone. They still scored in the red zone. <laughs> I mean, right, right. They they did, but they four sevens, fifty seven percent, and fifty seven percent over a season puts you around eighteenth in the NFL. It's about where Pittsburgh's at right now. They're fifty eight percent, seventeenth in the league. So it, it's it's an average output. Uh, but the way they started that game one and three, were you, were sure. you, were you not, uh, did they not amuse you moving? <laughs> was I not entertained? <laughs> yeah. I was hands over eyes. I mean, cause the one was the five plays, you get the DPI. I mean, my, my benchmark, roughly speaking for red zone efficiency is about two thirds of the time. Two thirds puts you around top 10, which is two thirds this year. would be around sixth place in the NFL. So that's kind of the goal I want to set. They were about that last year. And so I think they are falling short of where they need to be in terms of red zone efficiency. I, I will, I will just say this. You drafted a damn running back with your first round pick. You can't, you, you know, you're telling me and, and you spent, you know, two two of your top four picks were offensive linemen. At this point right now, you tell me you don't have the confidence to uh, to, to, to get that thing in in three plays when you're inside the five or whatnot, you know? Yeah, but Dave, there's stacked boxes. Could you believe it? The boxes get tight around the five-yard line. <laughs> like if, that, if that's the excuse, then they're never going to run the football again because welcome to the NFL, man. That's going to be tight. Tight spaces. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, if you went out, you've got that investment in there, and it was we got to get the running game better, and if you and, and you've got a back that at least can get you three yards in a cloud of dust. Let's see, if I ran three times in a row at three yards, that gets me nine yards or should, right? So you can't get the take off my shoes. Yeah, you can't get the ball in the end zone in, in, in uh, uh, you know, in, in those amount of plays. So yeah, I mean you. You would like to see them get inside the ten and and crush it with a run, I think, and then take the football out of you know you're still going to pass in some situations there. But uh, uh, look, even that even that pass to, to Deontay Johnson, as good of a route as that was, and pass as it was for for Ben, how high percentage is that over yeah, t- over I mean- time? Yeah, it's it's effectively a fade. I mean, you have that kind of sluggo concept. I mean, I guess Pittsburgh's two for two on it because it was the same play against the Bills, a better pass by Ben. Ben said that pass was crappy to Deontay in the Chargers. I thought that was a great. good throw. I thought that it was, was a good great. throw. Yeah, I think maybe Ben just you know playing it up a little bit, but that was a, an A-plus throw from Ben. But, yeah, I, I get your point. Uh, the Steelers are, for the season, 58.06% uh, percent in the red zone. That's 17th overall. Uh, in, 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 in the red zone there, the 49ers are 77.78. The New Orleans Saints, you wouldn't have known it yesterday. 71.05%, uh, Arizona, 70.45%. You want, you want to know a key to the game, uh, this week here, the 
Bengals are 69.23% inside the red zone. Fourth best percentage right now there. So, uh, uh, Steelers better, you know, better keep the Bengals out of the end zone, especially if they get down that deep there. Uh, but he wanted to know the ranking 58.06, 17th, right in the middle of the pack in the NFL when it comes to red zone percentage there. And they were, uh, they were 66% last year, which was top 10. So there's been a drop off there, unfortunately. Uh, Chandler Stroud, Norwood, and the play of Bush. Chandler here, morning guys, fellas, have a happy, he wanted to briefly shout out this morning, this beautiful home state, oh no, we already hit on this one there the other day from, from Chandler, so uh, obviously with the holidays, not as many uh, uh, emails here, so I think we got through them all. All right, Dave, we'll come back on Monday to talk about this Bengals game, win, loss, or as the case of the season, draw, oh. potentially, <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, recap things and, and talk about the game. All right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause for the holiday season, go to SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button. Upright navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, you can find that on Steelers Depot. Hit the ad free button. Upright navigational bar for $25. You have an ad free uh, for, for one year from sign up there as well, too. So, uh, Alex and I. I will be back on Monday to wrap all this up. Boy, it sure would be nice to wrap up a divisional game, and and who knows what will happen Sunday night. You know, there maybe we'll maybe we'll have a, uh, some holiday optimism there, if you will. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.